Hello, and welcome to the Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Joe Lalo, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Andrea Pearson. And I'm Lindsay Baroker. We'll be answering some of your questions today, but before that, we're going to discuss a few of the points that Mark Coker made uh, in his article, 2020 Publishing Predictions, House of Indie on Fire. Uh, but before any of that, we're going to do some of our news, and because I'm first in the thing, I guess I'll start. <laughs> Uh, so my news for this section is uh, Book of Deacon Part 6 is now in the hands of the beta readers. So if you recall, I was doing this whole Year of Six thing, and I'm going to have the sixth book of the next three of my main three series written. So the first of them is done, unless my editor says that it is trash, in which case it is not done. Um, that will be edited in February, so that pipeline is finished. Uh, and it turns out, my editor follows my, uh, my newsletter because I had announced this whole plan to have the three main books done in the newsletter. And the editor was like, hey, I'm glad you said that in the newsletter because I'm almost out of slots for the year. So I ended up with two deadlines out of that newsletter going out because the editor was able to slide me in uh, in the gaps that I thought wouldn't be hard to get into. Uh, so that's that. Um, Free Rent 6 is the next sixth book that I'm writing and it is in the outline stage now. Uh, and then at the end of this month, in like two weeks, is the 10th anniversary of me getting started in the indie publishing game. Uh, Book of Deacon Part 1, which is the self-named for the series, came out on ja ja January 28th of 2010. Uh, I'm thinking I'm going to do a personal Q&A video um, if I get any questions. So far, there have been no questions, so it might just be an answer video uh, or announcement video. And I'm thinking, like, again, we all got excited about uh, Kickstarters after a recent episode, and I have been crunching the numbers on potentially doing a Kickstarter for an anniversary edition of my books because, uh, and I've mentioned this in earlier episodes, I don't have a hardcover because at the time, a hardcover print-on-demand was a pain, and it still sort of is a pain, but it's less of a pain, and if I do it as a Kickstarter, then it's not a pain at all because I can just have somebody else do it. So I'm crunching the numbers. I got the whole spreadsheet started and we'll see if I feel uh, energetic enough to pull that off sometime this year, probably in the summer. So I can sort of bridge books one and two uh, of the trilogy, which released pretty rapidly when I first started. And then uh, finally, 2019 was a really bad sales year for me. Uh, so I've pulled the plug on my, I pulled the plug on my previous advertising during the holiday season because it's kind of a bad time to be running advertising anyway. And uh, probably the first half of this year, le well, leading up to the first release uh, of, of this year, I'm going to be trying to revamp my, uh, my, my advertising and promotional approach to be a little bit more solid and in line with modern techniques. So those are my, my pieces of news. I thought that was funny that your editor watches your newsletter because mine does too and my Facebook page, but I didn't know that for a long time. So I'm like, oh man, I hope I never said anything like, right. well, the editor's behind, so the book's going to be late. I don't think so because she's good. <laughs> you know, like usually I'm the one behind, not her, but you got to watch out who's paying attention when you send out those newsletters. Yep. All righty. Well, for my news, I thought I would just share with you guys, speaking of advertising, um, I kind of went in and tinkered a little bit with my AMS ads here in January. I said I was going to just take a break from advertising in over the holidays, but I did not do that because I, <laughs> I've had these box sets doing really well. And I noticed I like turned down the ads and it's like, Roop, you know, they went way down the rankings. So I was like, okay, put those back up again because they're actually making a lot more than I'm spending on advertising. Whereas that's not usually the case with anything uh, when I do like a single book thing, but because these can make, uh, you know, I talked about it in the box sets episode, $10 or more for read through on the entire book, which is five books. Uh, you know, it, it's been worth it for me to keep those ads going. Uh, so it's actually been good because this is a time for me when I've, it's been a while since my last release and I'm working on a new series. I've actually almost done with the fourth book, in my urban fantasy series i've been talking about doing a rough draft of it but i've been these have been coming a lot more quickly uh, but still it's a time where i'm not publishing anything and that usually means the income goes down but um because i've had these i put a second box set out uh, agents of the crown was another five book series i did back in 2018 that was just kind of tootling around not selling much but it was still in ku so i was like well let me do another ku box set before it goes out so i put that out in november 
And it, uh, it actually took about a month. I was losing money on advertising, but I remembered with the last box set that it took a while for page reads to really start becoming significant. So I stuck with it. I almost pulled the plug, but then it flipped and was making a lot more uh, from the revenue than I was spending on ads. So that's running along nicely right now. I think it's in the around 500 overall in the Kindle store, which is better than I expected from that series because that series was not as popular as uh, the dragon stuff I've done. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I went in and tinkered in January here because I was trying to figure out how I could spend less to keep you know the same results we, as we all want. And I noticed that uh, you may remember this if you've been doing Amazon ads for a while. About a year ago, they added this thing where you could bid a higher percentage to be in the first or near the top of the product searches or to be on the, on the search results page. And I just randomly was like, well, sure, I'll bid 25% and see what happens. And I actually went in, <laughs> as you should do immediately, but I did not, uh, and looked at like, you know, you can kind of go in now the, and they give pretty good uh, breakdowns of like which keywords are actually working for you to make money on. And I also found the spot where it shows these placements and basically I was bidding this 25% higher in order to be at the top of the search results and getting practically no return on that. Like people would click and not buy. Like it was my worst ACOS and worst sales out of anywhere. And I was like, just turn that off. But it was worth it for me to bid that 25% on the product placement pages because uh, it was actually doing well or even better than the average there. So. Uh, you know, we'll see if it actually makes a big difference on the money. But I thought if that's something you just went with like me and then never actually went in and saw if, <laughs> if that's working, then you guys might want to check it out too. Um, Joe and Andrea, have you uh, looked at that stuff and it had similar results or any, have you checked it out before? I haven't, uh, I haven't fiddled with it. Like I say, my, my most recent experience with Amazon was completely pulling the plug on all advertising. So I sort of want to, want to wipe the slate clean. I had a lot of ads that were doing pretty well, but they were doing pretty well on like default settings. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you how, how that broke down. I will be analyzing that more in the future. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't done a whole lot with Amazon ads. Uh, my husband runs those and I'll have to see what he's been doing lately. We usually will give an update on Amazon and Facebook ads on our podcast, but we kind of put our podcast on the back burner for a little bit. <laughs> for those listeners who listen to my podcast are like, what the heck? Where did you guys go? But yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll take a look at that sometime. All right, because I, I know I'm not somebody that's going to go and look at every single keyword. I just don't have the time, but this was a fairly quick thing to look at. Um, and I was going to say too, Joe, because I was thinking about that, because these were backlist series for me that I had published uh, a year, year and a half before that I made the box sets for. And I feel like you get this a little bit of a boost by being a new release too. So I don't know, if you, as you're playing around, especially I think you've done, I don't know if you're in KU now with anything, but, you know, maybe doing a new release, even bundling like two, two sets of two, so you can have a new release and then add the advertising on. Like it's, I feel like it's really hard to get advertising to do much on the older stuff that's already kind of back in the rankings. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I have, I still have the three urban fantasy books. I haven't pulled them wide yet. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna wait until I have all five out, which means probably the end of, of this year because I don't anticipate getting book four written anytime soon, let alone book five. Yeah, you do kind of, I think you want to wait for, because you have readers that bought full price too. Like, this is probably, if you have, even better if it's four or five years old, you know, yeah. then nobody's going to be surprised if you do a 99 cent box set. Um, and the other thing I thought I would just share is kind of about advertising too. I, you know, it's January, so I was looking at sort of my 2019 expenses and income and nothing's finalized yet. Uh, you know, as we record this, it's like January 13th. So haven't gotten 1099s and stuff yet, but you know, you, you, I keep track and you can figure out pretty closely. And I, I actually thought I would take a hit this year in income because my sci-fi series was the only new big new entity property I launched and it, you know, it did fine. I have, you know, it was not like it bombed or anything, but it didn't do as well as the previous year when I had the, the heritage of power dragon series that had been some of my high, it had been my highest earning months ever when, when that was coming out for, for a few months there. So that ended up bringing up the whole of 2018. Um, but 
Sort of the box sets kind of help keep me up there. So if my gross income actually went up a little bit, uh, it will, I think it'll be about even because I also spent like more on ads for those box sets. I, I realized I didn't spend any more on ads just for my basic stuff, uh, the series launch that I did this summer. So I don't know, I, I go back and forth on ads and like I love hate relationship. I think with a lot of us had that. We don't really want to be spending that money, but uh, if you can spend it and make it work for you, then, you know, you're a happy camper. It, it's nice not to have right now this big hit in income that I usually get when I'm uh, preparing to rapid release the next thing. So I think that is it for my news. Andrea, did you want to share anything before we jump into Mark Coker's talking about his stuff? Yeah, no, I don't want to share. <laughs> Just kidding. No, um, yeah, uh, I can represent all of our listeners who have insane, horrible, crazy personal lives. Um, we just barely got back. I was just telling Lindsay and Joe this, but we just got back from a doctor appointment for our baby. He's almost 10 months old now, and he's only gained a pound in four months, four and a half months. And he's actually technically lost weight since his last checkup two, two months ago. And it's because he's got like all sorts of food allergies and sensitivities and he keeps getting sick. And so per doctor's orders, we are officially quarantined for the next two or three months. And uh, yeah, just things are just really stressful right now. Our kids, everybody's been sick except me the last week. And I'm like, go me. I almost never get sick, but it just, it just sucks because it disrupts our sleep so much. And so, so the only thing I'm working on right now is my midnight chronicles and I've got that one let's see that one. Let's see the third book in that series, Twilight Road comes out at the end of this month and I'm almost done with revisions. I'll have those done here in a couple of days. And then let's see, we did find a narrator for the shade amulet. That's the first book in my um, Coven Chronicles. And we've got a bunch of narr narrators who've auditioned for discern so that we have to pick one of those out here soon, but that's pretty much all I'm doing. I've, I had to even put dictating, even though dictating only takes like 10 minutes a day, I had to put that down as well because I don't know, my husband, he was like reading this study or article or something where this dude psychologist is like, if you have, he's like, everybody has 24 hours, but you only have the ability to make a certain number of decisions a day. And some days deciding just to survive is all you can handle, even though you have time to do other things. And so, <clears throat> so I'm kind of at the point right now where I just, I'm like, if I change my clothes, in a day. It's, it's, a, it's a huge miracle because of how things are going. And then, and I'm like, if I shower, I mean, I sent a text to my mother-in-law like a couple days ago saying I am clean because I hadn't showered in several days. So, I mean, right now we're just kind of in the, you know, the put our heads down brace against the storm. Um, but because I do have my deadlines and I still, I can't not write, like I have to write even when everything's crazy. It's where I get my release, you know, and so I still work on books, but I just can't do as much as I was previously. So there you go. <laughs> well, it makes everybody else's complaints sort of pale in comparison. <laughs> Business and personal do not weigh the same. But um, we're going to move on now to the first of our of our topics, which is the 2020 publishing predictions from Mark Coker of Smashwords. Um, we have interviewed Smashwords, uh, Mark Coker, on our previous podcast, and uh, I have worked with him personally on a handful of promotions. So I, I have a lot of respect for the uh, his expertise, and he likes to dump a lot of expertise into into uh, the the predictions post annually. This one was a doozy, so we're, so we're going to step out some pieces and, and discuss them. Uh, to set the tone, this is a bit of the article snipped for brevity. To my eyes and ears, indies are experiencing increased pain, anxiety, desperation, and depression. Many best-selling authors from four or five years ago have, been, have seen their sales plummet. Some have cut back production or quit writing altogether to take on a real job that pays. When I meet an author who's suffering, they're often quick to blame themselves for any misfortune. This year, I heard each of the following repeatedly. I need to learn how to do better on, on Amazon ads. I need to learn how to do better on Facebook ads. I need to learn, I need to find more paid marketing opportunities. The above answers feel like a moth saying, I need to fly faster toward the flame. So discuss. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. Um, we should say that anybody that didn't see the article, it's pretty down <laughs> overall, that, that gives a hint. And um, I actually just found another one that came out from Written Word Media that we might talk about on a future show. It was a little more 
acknowledging that things are getting harder that's certainly nobody's I don't think anybody's going to argue against that there's more competition it's you know it's harder to get seen and it's like early on you could have do less professional covers and that kind of thing and still you know and less professional books uh, I feel that now if you most of the stuff I was when I was looking at urban fantasy you know picking stuff out of the top 100 is a lot different than maybe six seven probably like five six years ago I was looking through the sci-fi romance category because I was going to put my pen name in there and there were a lot of like really poorly edited books at the time like just on the grammatical level not even going into like developmental editing and you know you know not every book that's out there is going to appeal to you but I, I just found that overall like the levels much more professional now uh what you're seeing from indie authors in order to be in that top 100 for your genre um so i agree that things have gotten harder uh, i think that you know like this stuff like i need to do better on amazon ads i need to do better on facebook ads is sort of the tactics kind of side of the business and i i definitely think authors that's probably what you're going to hear a lot like at conventions and things it's sort of the exciting water cooler talk what what are you doing with ams ads right now that's doing really good uh what about your facebook what, what kind of images are you using on your facebook ads but i i feel like uh we are also aware of larger term strategies most of us and at the same time we're just kind of quietly like trying to go our email list you know still doing promotions that will bring in hopefully new uh you know long-term fans and subscribers and trying to treat our fans well. I hope we're all doing this and that we don't uh, lose sight of the forest through the, through the trees, whatever that expression is. So I, I feel like this is maybe a little overly pessimistic, but at the same time, I do understand where he's coming from. I, you know, cause I hear a lot of that too at the conventions. It's like, this is what, what let's talk about what's working right now. But I, I don't think we're really as a group totally losing sight of the big picture. Yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, like, if I didn't know better, I would think that he wrote that hunk about me, uh, especially since I, I, I had been dealing with him four or five years ago, and I was at a much higher peak at that time. Except if, if it was about me, you'd have to throw book bub ads into that list. Um, one of the tricky things about this business is that it changes quickly and slowly. Uh, like, I've been fortunate that I've not chased a lot of the fleeting spikes. Like, I, I, I've, I've, I've taken the long term uh, from, for, you know, from way back. So I didn't, I didn't, like, ride a wave that went out from underneath me but on the other side the slower steadier shift towards saturation and general increasing quality and therefore greater difficulty in standing out that got me pretty that got me pretty good and i'd planned for this sort of downturn so like i've got a nest egg but it's obvious that just doing the same thing and hoping it gets better isn't a sane way to course correct so when you need to improve your situation you do your research and you try new tactics and that's sort of what he's talking about and what Lindsay said where like I mean, obviously, you're not going to talk about. One would hope that your that your your baseline performance uh, is solid, or else you wouldn't really have even gotten to this point. So it's the the bits and pieces. Like you're probably not going to talk about completely revamping your entire writing. Like maybe you will talk about writing, you know, uh, dictating or something like that. But I feel like when the time comes to make changes, you make changes on the most mobile part of your process. And for most of us, that's going to be our promotional aspect, which also has a way of, uh, of it's one of those things that changes fastest. So ads and marketing are what we're going to talk about. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's absurd or a sign or a bad sign to have people talking about how they're handling ads and marketing. I'll be doing other stuff too. Uh, but just going wide and is, is a way to make sure that you, just as going wide is a way to make sure that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, building multiple marketing techniques is a skill that protects you from changes like you just try new things and see how they work um and i'm i i don't know <laughs> i'm i'm kind of negative today already just cranky over what's been going on so i'm like when i read over this and this is not just today this is i feel like this is the way his blog posts have been for like the last five years he's so negative in them and so he hates Amazon. And I'm like, we know you hate Amazon. You can start every post with, I hate Amazon. And then it would be like a two paragraph long blog post. So <laughs> since Katie D. Slick came out, actually, that is a very good point. Um, he started becoming super, Lindsay made that comment in chat, but he started becoming super negative about Amazon really when Kindle Unlimited came out. But I'm like, of course, the other retailers are going to hate it. But how often do you hear, and sorry, Mark, that we're bringing you into the conversation because I know you listen. How often do you hear Mark Leslie Lefebvre badmouth Amazon? I'm going to say right now, 
the, the way Mark Coker is about Amazon has pushed me away from Smashwords more than anything else. And I still use Smashwords and I still love them, but I know authors who were on the fence before who are like, no, not going to go to that company anymore. They went to draft a digital instead because draft a digital was not, didn't bring personal opinions and, and feelings into the game. And, and if this makes people hate me, I, I apologize, but it's just, I, I like things that are, I don't know, like acknowledge the elephant in the room, but don't dwell on it. You know, don't make it such a huge deal because then that just, it just makes everybody unsatisfied and it makes everybody discouraged. Um, so, but that said, I definitely agree with Lindsay and Joe, both of them, what they've said, and I'm going to add the following. Um, so to me, the depression, the anxiety, all that stress, everything that everybody's felt, it's all part of an industry that is leveling out. Um, every new advancement. So like when the gold rush happened, like 1800, 1700, 1600, all of those gold rushes brought on a whole ton of excitement, a whole horde of new people. But as time ha passes and the low hanging fruit is gone and everybody realizes it's, it's basically based on hard work and productivity. Um, those who base, okay. So basically like, you, you know, the rose colored glasses, the, the, the positive, all of that excitement, all of it gradually drops. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, and people who aren't ready or aren't willing or aren't right for it will drop out or they'll fail to gain a ten, uh, gain traction. And then basically, so just to keep talking about gold, because you know, that's why I started. Um, people and companies are still successfully mining for gold and there will always be people and companies mining for gold, but it's not as easy as it, as it has been in the past. And those who are drawn to it because of that easiness are losing interest now. Um, but people, readers, or sorry, authors who are willing and able to stick around are they are they're sticking around it's a long time game now and and think about as like any other career like how many careers like mechanical engineering or becoming a doctor or any of that they require several years of education up front and they and if you start a new business i mean how many other businesses expect to start and not market and not have people find out about them i mean where i live here in utah there's like 3,000 little small cookie companies that have just started. And I, I know it's like a fad in other states as well, but there's like 40 of them in two or three cities that surround us. And these are like 50,000 people living in these cities. So they're not huge cities. And the thing is, they you can't just start a company and expect things to be amazing without marketing. If nobody knows your company exists, nobody is going to come to your company. And it's the exact same thing with being an author. Um, you write a book and publish it. That's just the very, very first part of the process. You actually do need to market and you need to learn. It's, it's part of having a well-rounded business. It's not just um, writing and, and publishing anymore. And so chances of striking it rich aren't high anymore. And those who do usually have paid the price, but success comes to those who don't give up. And so uh, you think of this as a business. You're, you, those first five years, I mean, it took me nine years to get through college because I didn't want to take out loans. And so I would work one semester, you know, three jobs, and then I'd go to college working two jobs and take one semester off every year. And so it took me like nine years. Plus I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> like changed my major five times. But seriously, like it takes how many years to get through college? So if you expect that four years of college time where you're doing college classes, you know, five to what, eight hours a day, and then homework additional to that, you're going to need to put that much time into becoming successful as an author with writing and revising and um, marketing and things like that. It's not just it, like they were saying, who was it, Joe or Lindsay? One of you guys was saying that several years ago, the books just weren't as good and they still made money. It's not like that anymore. Now we're like a legitimate, you know, market. We're a legitimate career path. What's the word I'm thinking of? Filled? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're like a legitimate section of the world of, of business where we have to be, we have to expect to put time into it. And unfortunately, not everybody's willing to put that time or that that marketing energy into learning things, you know, but those, this is something that, you know, I, I truly believe those who are willing to learn and learn how to do things well, will rise to the top. You can't not, I mean, you'll learn and you'll, you'll be able to spin faster. You'll, you'll take on new uh, abilities that you didn't think you could do before. You'll become faster writers, you know, all of that. So I don't know. I just kind of totally went on a tangent. <laughs> yeah, it's no problem. This is, people are interested in our insight. Uh, and and here's some more insight for you. We we picked out a, a list of uh, of five or so of the ten or so uh, things that he listed off. So we're going to start with number two: backlash coming against Amazon ads for stealing author platform. Amazon ads enable Amazon to sell your author platform form to the highest bidder. 
try this exercise to learn how it affects you. Click the Amazon homepage, select books, and enter your pen name. It's not uncommon for the first three search rows to be occupied by sponsored ads for four books by, for four, for four books by other authors. It's also common to find that up to one third of your search results on that page are promoting other authors that Amazon knows are not you. Each is a detour designed to take away your reader, uh, take away a reader from your books. It also means that Amazon is forcing indies to trample upon the platforms of fellow authors simply to remain visible in the store in the same way that KDP Select causes authors to trample upon the vis visibility of their fellow authors who refuse to go exclusive. You work hard to build up your readership and your author brand, and now Amazon's working hard to take it away, cloaked by the, by the vapid veneer of a paid marketing opportunity. So that was an elegantly worded thing. What do we think? I love alliteration. <laughs> vapid veneer, I'm gonna steal that, Mark. Um, I actually agree with a lot of this. Uh, it's it's definitely gotten tough and I feel like just as a reader looking for books I'm like why am I getting three other search results that are I typed in a specific author name and a title of a book I want that thing <laughs> why are you showing me this other thing and tying into my earlier comment that's probably why those convert so poorly because people probably click on it and then realize when they get to the page oh that's not the book I was looking for so definitely the search results are kind of a mess right now and I'll be curious if there's reader backlash. I don't think Amazon's going to care what the authors say. You know, we're, there's always going to be more authors to spend money, but I feel like there's so much advertising on the side right now that readers may uh, start to <laughs> revolt a little bit. And I don't know what that would, uh, you know, how Amazon would know unless their earnings go down. But, um, you know, it's tough. You can't afford to be mediocre anymore um, because if someone drops onto your book's page and they see something like with a cooler cover, in the advertising spots, they may wander off. Uh, on the flip side, you can take advantage of authors who haven't stepped up and maybe steal their traffic by paying for advertising. And it does make the environment more predatory, um, but that's kind of how business is. And you'll see that, you'll see like, I don't know, I grew up in Seattle and there'd be like, here's a Starbucks, in the parking lot of the same complex is the drive through coffee stand and kitty corner across the intersection is another independent coffee stand. And these guys are all competing with each other. And what, what we have to do is just, we have to not be a commodity. We have to write books that, you know, there's something of our voice, our personalities in there, something that uh, readers can only get from us. So they'll keep coming to us no matter which ads are on the page. Easier said than done, I know. But uh, that is sort of like you need to be careful on that right to market line. If you are just writing another of, you know, 20 things that are popular right now, you know, still make sure you're putting as much of yourself into it as possible and, and make it stand out and make it be unique. So you're not just like toilet paper that they can pick anyone off the shelf and then it becomes a who's got the cheapest price thing because if everything's the same, that's what people are going to go by. So that's, you know, I think we just have to work as hard as we always have and maybe a little more at, you know, making ourselves unique and building up a fan base that's loyal to our books and some other book that's advertised is not what they're looking for, so they're not going to go for it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what One of the things that I found myself doing, I, I just noticed that I was doing it, so it was subconscious. I no longer click on search results that have the word sponsored next to them, even if they're the ones that I'm searching for. Like often the first actual search result will also be a sponsored one. It'll be like, it'll be sponsored at the top and then two more sponsored ones and then the same one over again. I click on the one that's not sponsored, even though it's the same product. And it's just a weird thing my brain does. But uh, Amazon's advertising has been getting a little nutty. And uh, I really don't see things going back to the way they were because Amazon's making too much money doing it this way. Uh, it's scummy, but advertising tends to be tacky and that, that's just the very nature of advertising. Uh, that said, there, there are ways around it. Uh, you can defensively advertise, which isn't, the nice thing is if you are big enough that people are hugely targeting you to try to make money off of you, you can probably afford to fairly easily defend yourself. And if you're small enough that not a lot of people are targeting you, then it's not going to cost much to defend yourself. So the, like, at the very least, you can intelligently, uh, I mean, you're putting more money in Amazon's pocket, but that's the way things go. You can intelligently sort of short circuit the way that they're trying to steal traffic from you quote unquote. Uh, all that said, Amazon has illustrated a willingness to take action when advertising vendors into the realm of being misleading. There was a story a while ago about a health guru who had a book out and people started targeting uh, his book title and his author name 
uh, to sell supplements. And it made it look like he was, he was uh, uh, advertising. Well, it may look like he was recommending or advocating the supplements and he absolutely wasn't. And he complained and Amazon, it, it caused enough of a stink that Amazon decided to put some limits on targeting certain products towards certain people. So Amazon clearly is aware that if they are, if, if they are guiding uh, customers away from things that they're actually looking for, or worse, if they're guiding them toward things that are contrary to what they're looking for, they will take action. So we might see this sort of even out, but it's going to even out when it affects the customers, not when it affects the authors, because Amazon reacts very quickly to make customers happy, less quickly to make anybody else happy. Um, yeah, but th I think the current state of advertising isn't going to change much. This is sort of the new normal, and whatever we get is going to branch off from here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're not going to go backwards. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what he said about each, um, each of these things. So like, you know, people advertising on your page or people advertising on search results, they're designed, each detour is designed to take your reader away from your books. Um, and I'm countering to that. It's not designed to take readers away from your books. It's designed to make money for the company, basically whose bandwidth we're borrowing. So authors are, who are savvy will fill those spots with your own book, their own books. So if you're targeting yourself, then your books will show up in those search results. And um, so just think about like Barnes and Noble. So Amazon's product page is they have replaced bookstores. When you walk into Barnes and Noble, things are organized there in such a way where the books at the very back, actually any bar, any bookstore, the books at the back of the store aren't getting nearly as much airtime as the books in the front. And then, but Barnes and Noble specifically, they allow publishers to buy the easy, you know, those, they have those like those circle tables at the front with books on them. They allow publishers to buy those spots. And so um, that's um, Amazon basically does that. And except on Amazon, they allow even small indie publishers, even small ones person authors to buy that advertising space. Whereas in it with a, if you don't have a big bubble, big publisher, big publisher backing you, you can't do that with Barnes and Noble. Anyway, um, Lindsay, what are you saying there? It's hard to get them all. Are you saying like, uh, I was just, when uh, you target yourself with your yeah. ads, you can have as many as you want, but somebody still may be bidding more. Cause I, I even looked at Mark Dawson's page in the search results and he had <laughs> a lot of them, but some other people snuck in and you know, whoever's paying three bucks or whatever to be on his page. But yeah, you're right. Um, we might just have to accept that you have to target yourself now if you want to appear in your own search results. As messed up as that is, that it, like you know, like you were saying, uh, we're not paying Amazon. Well, we are paying Amazon to be there, but like we can't be entitled about it, right? It's an it's been a really great opportunity. It's still an opportunity, but Amazon doesn't owe us anything. We're just merchants for them. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and I mean, we target. Um, uh, my sister in law is calling me. <laughs> Sorry, my phone is facing me. Reject. No, we target myself. And yeah, there's, I mean, there will occasionally be books that sneak through and people target Mark. I mean, he's openly ad admitted that because of who he is, people target him because they want to take advantage of that, you know? So I'm like, if you stay a small author, your chances of getting targeted are less than authors who, you know, stand out there. So anyway, but um, I just, I think to me, just, you know, looking at it with a little bit more of a positive outlook. It's not all doom and gloom. If, if, if we are serious about this, then we'll learn how to do it and we'll learn how to be successful at it. And we will make adjustments in our lives and the sacrifices we need to make in our lives. You know, like I've got sick kids and I've got a baby who's losing weight and, you know, lots of crazy things, but I'm still writing. And so if, if, you're willing to do it. If you're willing to make the time for it, then it will work. And just think of the times when you're like really crazy, like right now, I mean, just think of that as prep for the future. So it's not just a this month thing. It's how are, how am I going to be doing with books in five years, not this month, you know? And so it doesn't, and just making sure that our businesses don't revolve completely around Amazon and don't revolve completely around eBooks. You know, there's so many different ways that we can branch out the end from me. <laughs> That's very true. And speaking of different ways we could branch out from ebooks, he had a, a number three on his list was uh, audiobooks disappoint. Uh, for indie authors, peak audio may already have come and gone. The audiobook market will grow in, 20, in, in 2020, but the average participating author will see slower growth or even declines. The first indie authors to do audiobooks reaped the most benefits. Now the market's getting crowded. Amazon's Audible division continues to maintain a, str a stranglehold on audio, and similar to Amazon's strategy to commoditize and devalue everything they sell, 
They've successfully, they're successfully devaluing audiobooks by restricting the author's ability to set their own prices and demanding long-term exclusivity for the best visibility, which means your profit opportunity will continue to decline in audiobooks for the same reasons that it has declined in eBooks. This one actually surprised me because I don't think I've seen anybody out there saying that audiobook sales have evened out. I feel like there have been more articles saying it's continuing to grow. Um, and then I feel like this last couple of years too, we've started to have more options. Uh, that was very true that Audible, they still set the prices and you're kind of at the whim for what they want to do there. But now you do have the option to not be exclusive and go with uh, Find A Way in particular. But uh, Kobo, I think you can now upload audiobooks too directly also. But um, I put a series in Find A Way in 2018. And it, it, you know, I thought it did quite well considering I wasn't advertising it. I'm not even sure I told anybody because I didn't know in the beginning where the it actually showed up, you know, but it, you know, it turns out they go to Apple and Kobo and a lot of places I've never heard and libraries. But uh, considering that particular series of five books, fantasy was exclusive to KDP Select with Amazon at the time. I didn't even, the books weren't even available out there. So it's not like they were driving sales of the audiobooks. but you know, I still, I'm about, I've made about 4,500 just on that series, just at find a way in, in about that year. So it's probably about even with like the 15% I lost because you do have to choose non-exclusive with ACX. So that puts you down to 25% there instead of 40% earnings. But you can um, pick your prices. And I did just recently, just last month, have my first uh, book bub deal. Uh, because if you're with Find A Way, it gets into their Chirp store. And I had gotten on a list at Nink to be a... Uh, you know, let me know when I can when I can have a chirp deal because it's still pretty new. I think it's an invite only kind of thing, and there's always a dog that's got to roam through when I'm on the <laughs> when I'm it's my talking turn. Um, so anyway, uh, that did quite well. I it I don't yet know the numbers uh, for this for last month from that, but I, I saw on the daily reports you know that I got a lot of downloads of that book one at 99 cents. Uh, and there's starting to be some sell through of the other audio books in the series. So I, I feel like there's more opportunities coming with audio and I don't think the things have leveled out yet. I feel that people find, you know, love audio for the car, the gym, all the reasons people listen to podcasts and that's been growing. Uh, I, I think it's still growing is my thoughts. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, this is one of those where, uh, like, there's no doubt that the audiobook market is more saturated than it was before because more people are, are interested in producing audiobooks and there's just more in the authors overall. Uh, the market's also growing uh, with more non audio book, more, more non audible places to sell books, like Lindsay was saying. Uh, if you want proof of that, uh, Books to Read now allows you to do audiobook links like you can add audiobook links to your universal links and when i was messing with it I, I think still you couldn't just automatically put one and it would find all the others so you had to go through and find the links for your books manually for each of the storefronts and there's a lot of storefronts that your books show up on if you're on find a way so there's a lot of places to buy books not, that aren't audible and uh, the saturation on audiobooks will never reach the point of ebooks. No matter how saturated it gets, ebooks will always be more saturated because there's a very low bar for entry for ebooks. You can do it for basically nothing, but audiobooks are are very high bar for entry unless you do profit sharing, and it's it's kind of hard to to get a quality book that way. And I think that the the narrators are becoming increasingly savvy that the kind of person who who uh, like well, it's very hard for the for the narrator to break even on on profit sharing. Uh, because they have to put a tremendous amount of effort up front. So no matter how saturated it gets, it's going to be a, a less crowded market than eBooks. Now, whether or not there's like the demand, like I say the market will be less less crowded, meaning that there will be fewer products to purchase. Whether or not the demand will, will meet the number of products available, I don't know. I don't have the numbers on that. But uh, it's also just as a, as, a, as a second note here, I found it odd that uh, he would say that Audible was devaluing audiobooks because the main issue I had with Audible and the main thing that I liked once Find A Way came around is that I could lower the price of my books. Like Audible was pricing my books way higher than I, my audiobooks, way higher than I wanted them to be priced. So like Amazon certainly encouraged people to to low like price low on their eBooks, but they were forcing you to price high on your audiobooks. So it struck me as odd that that would be considered devaluing books in this in this context. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, um, so I don't agree with his prediction on this. 
the market isn't getting crowded. Uh, there are far too many coming advancements in technologies for us to really see a saturation point yet. Like, you know, AI, things like that. And we'll have Lindsay Broker, Lindsay Broker. We're gonna have Lindsay Broker on the show next week. <laughs> no, we can't having... wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait, did I not talk to you about that ahead of time? <laughs> Uh, no, we're having Joanna Penn on the show here soon, and we're going to be talking to her about her, you know, her new book and about AI and things like that. I'm sure it'll come up. Um, but there's just so many advancements in technology that are coming with, uh, with all of that stuff where it's not, it hasn't reached saturation point yet. Once I think that it'll reach saturation point once, um, once audiobooks are as easy and as cheap to put together and sell as eBooks and print. So, I mean, you know, print is really easy now. You got POD. You don't have to go and print off, you know, 1,500 copies of book. You can have somebody buy one copy. I mean, it's simplified quite a bit. And even, I mean, Vellum, you know, Vellum makes print, you know, creating a print book super fast and super easy now. There's just so many things that they've done to make print easier and to make eBooks easier. But, I mean, it's not until, I don't think that it will reach saturation point until audio is as easy and as Joe was saying, as cost effective as eBooks. Absolutely. Uh, and right. I didn't rant that time. <laughs> Very true. All right. Next point is single copy books, uh, single copy eBook sales face continued pressure from Kindle Unlimited. When readers have unlimited access to over 1 million eBooks with their Kindle Unlimited subscription, they can read for free. Then when the subscription service and when the, the subscription service decouples author compensation from author set single copy price of the book, it's a recipe for significant devaluation. It's a popular word here. Uh, and it gives readers over a million reasons to never purchase another single copy ebook again. Even 99 cent ebooks start to look too expensive to readers when they read other books for what feels like free. So my thoughts on this one is that Kindle Unlimited is more of a competitor for libraries than having to do much with the sale of eBooks. Um, people who are now KU subscribers were people who checked out books from the libraries before. They read a lot. They cannot afford to buy everything, especially like trad published eBooks at $9.99. You know, if you read a book a day, who can afford that? So I, I feel like I'm not sure I agree that it's devaluing the ebook because you don't get to keep it. You check it out of KU the same way you check it out of the library and you have to return it in order to get more books. And I actually, my best case scenario is when I have people borrow my books from KU. So I, they read it, I get credit for the page reads and then they're like, Oh, this was good. I'm going to buy a copy. So I get paid twice for that book. And I've had many times when people have told me they've done that. So I assume it happens lots more often than that from uh, people who don't say anything. So I, you know, I understand the fear, you know, if you can get something for almost free, then why would you pay for it? But if you want to own a copy, you still have to pony up the money for it. Yeah, uh, there there are different types of ebook customers, I think. Like some people will use KU, others won't. I, I don't use KU, for example. Uh, I don't even know how it works, really, uh, from the user side. I know how it works from the other side. Uh, it's true that before KU, customers didn't have an option but to buy single copies uh, or go to the library. Like there wasn't, there wasn't really a subscription service that had worked up until that point. And once KU came along, then the sort of people who like that kind of model stopped buying single copies. So in that way, uh, you can say that they took away single book sales. But um, there's always going to be people who prefer to pick and choose their books. And if you are the kind of person who only reads once in a while, it doesn't make sense to use KU because now you're paying a monthly fee for a book that you could more, like if you're only going to read one or two books in that month or, or even one or two books every few months, uh, KU is a bad deal uh, because you could just buy a book for less than that and, and it would meet your needs. And obviously the most valuable individual customers are the people who read tons of books and we would love to get access to them and those are the ones who are more likely to be in KU. I mean, we can get them by being in KU, uh, but Overall, uh, the occasional readers are probably a far larger market. Like we're going to sell fewer in the books to each of them, but there are far more of them. So, and those are the ones who aren't going to be in KU. So I think that while KU is a gigantic shift in the way the business works, I think that there's an enormous portion of the market that is untouched by KU and still targetable by anybody who wants to sell single copies. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to rant. 
Uh, I use Kindle Unlimited the same way I use the library and I still use the library, but I also use Kindle Unlimited now. So I read a ton of books through Kindle Unlimited and the ones that I want to keep, I buy. And there, and like what Lindsay was saying, there's a lot of readers who are like that. I also hear from readers regularly who read my books in Kindle Unlimited and then buy a copy of it. Um, and then for me, like with my favorite authors, I don't even bat an eye. I will, I don't even use Kindle Unlimited sometimes. I'll just buy the book outright, even if the book is available on Kindle Unlimited. And so, um, and that's me buying at full price, things like that. Um, anyway, but you're always going to have freebie seekers. People, it's just human nature. People will always, there's always going to be a segment of the population who wants everything for free and you're not going to get away from that, but you'll also get people who buy everything. So I have members of my street team, my review crew who read, I mean, who I get all, I, mean, I send all my free books to them re regardless, but they still will buy them every single time. And it's not just because they want to get a verified tag. They just want to buy my books. And so, which, you know, I think that's really cool, you know, but that's just the way it is. You're going to have people who go both directions. So, um, I don't, I don't agree that Kindle Unlimited is, you know, destroying everything. Um, I think that Kindle Unlimited is gradually destroying the libraries. <laughs> like Lindsay was saying, uh, libraries are struggling, you know, they, they've got overdrive, but a lot of the publishers aren't even putting their books into overdrive anymore. I don't know if you guys have heard anything that's been going on with that, but but um, publishers are refusing to put their books into the library system now. And so, I mean, that that's not just Kindle Unlimited. You can't just blame, you know, Amazon for all of that. There's a lot of stuff that's going on there. Yep. All right. Last, last point we're going to make here. Uh, indies will redouble efforts to build their mailing lists. When a reader subscribes to your author newsletter, you own that relationship. You can reach that reader on your terms whenever you choose. You can direct the reader to retailers whose missions are aligned with your own and who are not trying to sell your reader someone else's book when they're looking for your book. I think indies have been pretty savvy about mailing lists for quite a few years now. You know, early days, 2010, maybe 2011, we were like, what? What's a mailing list? <laughs> you know, should, we, should we have this? What's a Facebook page? Should we have one of those? Um, you know, but I think probably at least for the last six, seven years, there have been a lot of people saying like, okay, you got to get readers onto your mailing list so that no matter what happens, you can always reach them and say like, hey, please buy my book here. And, you know, if a day comes when that's not Amazon, then you do have that option. Uh, I remember last year there was a fantasy author that was booted from Amazon for whatever reasons. And uh, he recently ran a Kickstarter and made 80000 for a, I don't know, book six in his series that he basically couldn't publish on Amazon. And, that, you know, I'm sure that was because he had built up a mailing list and was like, hey, guys, can't publish it on Amazon, but you can get it here on Kickstarter. And, you know, that's not a bad paycheck for one novel. So... Uh, I think we all realize the value of our mailing list. So maybe yes, <laughs> I, I don't disagree. I think we've all already been paying attention, but I think we'll continue to pay attention. And the more you of a fight it is to get people through advertising, you know, like why pay $20 to retarget people if you could just get them on your mailing list, you know? So I do think that that will continue to be a priority for us. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's not a whole lot I can add. Uh, mailing lists or some sort of direct contact method uh, that is completely controlled by you is should always be a core tactic. Like if it's not a mailing list, it's your blog or something like that. But but yeah, it, you should have a pretty darn central thing that is yours. Yeah, I don't agree with this either. Um, I don't think any redoubling will take place. Authors have been focusing on newsletter lists for years and those who are just starting to focus now are new authors and authors who have always wanted to do it but haven't, in which case they're not redoubling. Um, I'm guessing he realized he needed something that wasn't inherently negative in his post, so he included this. <laughs> but um, either way, authors who know the importance of a newsletter list still know the importance and all of us occasionally redouble our efforts, but it's not going to be a massive redoubling. Okay, and uh, we, we, we're, we're actually getting to listener questions, folks. Let's see if we can get through them pretty quickly. Um, Yay! <laughs> so the first one we have here is uh, J.R. Handley from the form on our website. Could you cover what goes into making and planning a successful holiday-themed anthology? Valentine's Day is coming up, so this will be relevant to that. Uh, uh, I've usually been involved with genre stuff rather than holiday stuff. I don't, most of my stuff is secondary world. So most of the holidays don't exist in my stories. <laughs> so I'd have to write something specific for it. But, um, 
I would say that a lot of the same rules apply for successful stuff. And again, on the previous, on, on uh, you know, the fantasy sci-fi fantasy podcast, we talked to some folks who are experts in this. And there's things like pick a healthy mix of people who are both high quality writers and good promoters. Like if, if you have a ton of really good stories, but nobody's good at promoting, then that's a problem. So try to make sure that you've got some folks who can get the word out. Uh, try to arrange the stories uh, in the actual book, like the actual reading order of the book, to lead with strength and end with strength, so that people have a good taste in their mouth when they're when they're when they're finished. You certainly want to lead with strength because because it it benefits no one to put your weakest story first, because then people first off will give a bad review, and second, won't nobody else in the book will get any value out of it. So uh, it's stuff like that, like you structuring your your thing intelligently is going to work for this as well as any other kind of anthology. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I've never done anything holiday themed, so I don't have a lot to say here. Uh, but I do feel as a reader that it's important to make sure the subgenres of all of the works match if you're including other authors. But if you're doing your own books, it's still a good idea to combine similar books. So because readers don't tend to cross the genres as much as authors do. So like if you're doing a Regency romance anthology, make sure they're all Regency romance and don't throw in like contemporary romance, vice versa, like epic fantasy and contemporary fantasy. Just make sure the books fit each other in theme and feel so that you're targeting the same readers. Yeah, I have not put together a holiday anthology. I'm with Joe, I write all these made up world stuff. So I think I've done Winterfest <laughs> and a couple of stories for basically Christmas. Um, but the, th the big thing is to be able to publish it pretty early. I like, I know JR asked this like in December, so we were joking about it being for Valentine's Day, but uh, I usually see the Christmas stuff being coming out in early November at the latest, because it takes time, you know, uh, to get the recommendation engines rolling, if you're going to have a hope of that, and you want to give yourself as many weeks as possible to sell it, because the day after Valentine's Day or the day after Christmas, you're going to find fewer people looking for those holiday stories. Uh, it is certainly something you can keep, take advantage of. I, I feel like in romance, especially, I see a lot of people that just put together a novella in their you know small town where they're having all their stories their series set they're like let's do a christmas novella and you can get a really big boost from people looking specifically for christmas stories and i to the lesser extent the other holidays you know if you do horror i think it makes a lot of sense to do a, a halloween anthology uh, but get it up there early and then you've got something uh well, if it's an anthology with other authors, you're going to have to talk to them and figure out, you know, what contracts and what rights you're going to have. If you're doing your own holiday story, you can continue to plug it each year. And I've also seen authors put together group promos for like Christmas and July sales. So there, there's no reason you can't give it another shot and try to move those stories other times of year also. Yeah. And I, I imagine if you leave it up long enough, you could probably cycle around to the next time the holiday comes up. <laughs> Um, all right, so next question is from JDL Roselle. I'm going to get almost all these names wrong, so apologies. <laughs> you can yell at me in the, in the Facebook group, which is where this question came in. Uh, hey there, also a previous listener to Marketing SFF uh, and really enjoying the new show. My question has to do with newsletters. One of my worries is that I tend to bounce between series when sharing my, with my newsletter. So I might share one thing for uh, one series one week and then totally pivot to a different series next week. Do you all focus on one series for a set time, or do you also find yourself bouncing between different series? Uh, do you think that one or the other is more effective? Do you think that bouncing back and forth is confusing or a turn off to readers? Uh, I bounce, but my newsletters have been traditionally almost inadvisably far apart, so it's less of an issue. Like It bounces along with what I'm writing. And so. It, it wouldn't make sense for me to focus, like it would make sense for me to focus on writing in one series for a long period of time, but I don't. So it would not make sense for me to target all of my emails toward uh, one thing when I start working on something else. Um, I think the common wisdom is that focus will serve you better overall. Uh, um, probably others can speak more to this because I haven't tried it yet, but you can consider creating separate lists or sub lists of fans tagging people who came in on certain sign up forms. That, that would be easier to do, obviously, if it's sign-ups up front, but there are ways to separate out your, your newsletters to people who are only interested in one of your many topics. Yeah, I've heard of a lot of authors who do that. It's just super hard, even if you set it up at front, to know who has received and who has read which series. And, you know, it's just, it tires me to think about doing that. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to assume you all read all of my books or that you haven't read any of my books and just make that assumption forever. <laughs> Um, but it's hard to know uh, what to talk about where readers are concerned. Uh, I try to stay focused on one series of time at a time, but what usually happens is I focus on mainly my new releases and I neglect my backlist. 
But as I've found, I mean, as you go along, it gets to the point where that's kind of necessary though, because you have too many books to focus on. And so helping readers focus on the next series, the one that's the most important, which is your release, you know, your new release is is a good place or good idea, a good place to start, good idea. Um, I do have an every email I send out to my list, every every email, um, a specific footer that has all of my books in it and just little 75 megapixel or whatever megapixel, whatever they're called, <laughs> pixel uh, images of all of my book covers. And I just have them really small down there just to make sure readers, it's kind of like a unobtrusive way to remind readers of, of books that exist. And it's visual so they can see at a glance. They don't have to actually read the titles. Cause a lot of people, I mean, their eyes would glaze over reading that many titles. Uh, for myself, I started up a, a new newsletter, a new list when I started my sci-fi. So now I have one that's become the fantasy one. And when this become devoted to sci-fi and it's, you know, it was a choice because I think for marketing and publishing purposes, I found for myself, it's been a lot more effective to focus on one series at a time and try to publish that to completion or nearly completion before herring off on something else. There's just a lot more momentum. You're only trying to focus on most, you can put most of your advertising dollars into that new, you know, whatever your new series for the year or for years, however long you're going to be working on it. So I have found that to be useful. And because of that, there'll be long gaps where I don't have like any new fantasy. That's the position I'm in now. I'm going to be basically restarting my fantasy list. And I'm, as we talked about on a previous episode, I'll be giving them some free stuff for the new fantasy. So that the first thing they get to me after get from me after a gap is a, uh, here's a free story, <laughs> you know? So I'm not like, Hey, hey buy something. Um, and that is a challenge. If you do two lists, are you going to keep emailing them? consistently every month or every week if that's what you decide you're going to do. I, I tend to let things go follow, I guess, it, while I'm focusing on the other genre because I don't like to just send out letters that are like, hey, this is free this month or, you know, you run out of things to say and you make more work for yourself. Uh, if you've got a pretty good subscriber base, you're going to get replies every time you send out a newsletter. So, whether it's good or bad, I don't know, it's something I kind of struggle with too because of that strategy of focusing on one genre and one series at a time. It means the other one goes quiet. Uh, but I did not want to do the thing where I had it all together because I have fans that only want my fantasy. And I figured if I was going to send out eight newsletters, basically, here's a new release on the sci fi, here's a free short story for the sci fi, that I'd be more likely to lose those people than if I just went quiet until I have some more fantasy for them. And you know, in a perfect world, I'd try to keep both, you know, letters going out of some interest, <laughs> you know, to both of them all the time. But that's what's working for me right now. And it doesn't seem to be that hard for me to revive an older list. Um, maybe at this point, they've read, I have enough books out and they've read enough books that they're not necessarily forgetting about me if I'm quiet for six months. Uh, hopefully that is the case. I don't usually get a ton of unsubscribes when I go back and start sending newsletters again. All right. Next up is Meg Jolly on Facebook. Uh, I would love to know all about, I would, yeah, I would love to know all your thoughts on effective branding, how to achieve that as whimsy, can't read today, how to achieve that as whimsical storytellers who have to figure out how best to present ourselves to the world to sell books when all we really want to do is hermit and hide. Um, okay, so I think the most effective branding is the sort that your audience picks up on without your guidance. Um, and I'm talking about like author, like just sort of the personality you put forward, uh, both in your books and in your social, social presence. Generally speaking, I don't recommend reading all of your reviews, but if you do read reviews and, uh, and other sort of feedback like that, uh, chances are you'll start to see positive comments cluster around similar themes and those themes are your brand now. Congratulations. Uh, apparently, I write strong female protagonists and cute critters. These are two things that are part of my brand. I didn't do it on purpose, but those are the things that people really get a kick out of. So I try to, you know, when I have pictures of cute critters, uh, which is a thing that I do also, art is one of my things, uh, try to be genuine is, is the other thing too. Like, don't try to artificially inflate that stuff. People can tell a phony unless you're really good at being a phony, and then you should just be an actor and not an author. Uh, so you can single out a couple things that, that drew you to the genre and, and make a point to talk those up because they drew you to the genre and you're actually interested in them. So you'll find your author brand coming together because of your focus on that and sort of enthusiastically talking about those things. Lindsay has her dragons and I've got art of all sorts. 
this just becomes a part of your brand because it's a thing that you legitimately like. So like, that's my feelings on, on, on general author brand. And also uh, it, it doesn't hurt to associate yourself with a visual that is sort of constant. Like I, uh, if you're watching the video, I have coins that have a symbol on the back that is basically my author brand. Like if you see that symbol, then that's Joe Lalo. Uh, so you can do that too. <laughs> that's kind of cool. So I'm going to start looking for that symbol everywhere. <laughs> Um, so author branding is something they talked about quite a bit at this recent business masterclass and it's kind of overwhelming, honestly, just, I mean, we're just, we're struggling to make, you know, publish books and struggling to find readers and author brand is advanced marketing is what they were saying. And it's, and it's broad, it's overreaching. It's like a far, it's like seeing things farther ahead in the future, because if you decide to brand something, you're going to have to do work, you know, back backwards and whatever to retcon to fix things from the past. Um, oh, and by the way, hi Meg. <laughs> um, so I've purchased a logo that fits me as a romance and a fantasy author, and I'll be doing some updating when I get the chance to make things match across the board. Um, I use the same fonts on my book covers for my author name, uh, for all of the books that I write for romance and for fantasy. Uh, you can get away with that. You can't really get away with that with titles though. So that's why I do it with my author name. And then one thing um, I would recommend, pick a couple of colors that resonate with your personality and the genres you write in and use those in all the usual places, like on your website, on Facebook, things like that. Just, it helps readers. It helps to solidify who you are for readers. And it's not required, but I mean, it is, it can be helpful. But this is, a lot of this is geared much more strictly towards nonfiction people uh, where this kind of branding is very important. Um, anyway, so there's also the option of hiring designers who create brands. So there are design, cover designers who will also create brands for you. They'll help you figure out what would work best for you to represent yourself uh, to your readers. And they'll do, you know, logos. They'll, they'll do, these are the colors that fit you that don't turn people away. These are, you know, just sorts of things like that. But again, I'm, I'm kind of at the barely surviving normal life. And so brands that's, you know, that's way advanced for where a lot of authors are. I think that if you just focus to begin with on making your series cohesive, you know, same barn, same font and stuff in within the series. And then if you always write in the same genre, if you are a dedicated urban fantasy author, you can definitely use the same font, you know, style on each book, uh, each series. Because uh, there's a lot of power in somebody being able, to, being able to look at a book and be like, oh, well, that's an Andrea Pearson book, obviously. It looks like an Andrea Pearson book. So that, that's not a bad thing. Uh, where you get in trouble is like with those of us, which is all of us here on the podcast that do not focus on one genre only, you will find that there's different fonts that are kind of used like in sci-fi, from fantasy, from romance. So you're probably going to want to make it look right for the genre rather than forcing you know, your cover artist to use your same typical font that you used for your other genre. So that's something to think about. And one thing, even if you're all over the place with the genres, if you can think about what, you know, what is always in your books, you know, I, I don't have it on my books, I should, but I'm always like quirky characters, epic adventures. It's how I think of myself, all the books I write that kind of, you know, that's what you're going to get. I remember years ago, an interview with CJ Lyons, who her tagline is thrillers with heart. And I, you know, I think she does like romantic suspense. So there's always a romance or, you know, something with the thriller element. And, you know, that, that can be a way to have something cohesive, even when you're writing all over the place. There's, there's probably something about you that is, uh, you know, every, that's in every book. And, you know, I, Joe actually made a great point about <laughs> me and my dragons, which was like, I didn't even think, I didn't think of that's not my brand. I just, I post some stuff about dragons now and then, and uh, the dragon toilet paper took off on Facebook. That was my one and only really viral post. And so I started doing more like that, but it is funny how many people I've come up to now that are like, oh yeah, we see that you're the dragon person, or they tweet me like dragon stuff or share it with me on Facebook. So I apparently, even though fewer than half of my books actually have dragons in them, dragons are now my brand. So <laughs> All right, um, that's it for me on that. If you want to move on, Joe. Okay, also, tiny thing I just realized, and uh, uh, all of my, across my three very dis different genre series, I have the same cover illustrator, and I have illustrated covers. And it's a little thing, but you can sort of tell. Like, like not a, obviously, not a lot of people are going to have Nick Delagaris as their, their cover illustrator. So if you see a, a cover illustrated by him, 
it kind of looks like a Joe Lalo cover if you've read any of my books. So that's another thing that, that sort of helps. But next up, Scott C. Morgan. Have you ever gone back well after publication and reworked slash rewritten some of a novel to improve it? When is it worth the time to do so, given that writing a new book is usually the best use of time? I'm talking more about more than a new proofread, more of an overhaul. Uh, related question, have you ever pulled a book from, earlier, from an earlier part of your backlist due to subpar craft of the book, or would you let it stand as uh, an early work? So I have, re I have never reworked something after release. Uh, I have gone back to do very serious typo cleanup because my first three books were not professionally edited when they were initially released. Uh, a good time to do that sort of thing is when you've got a, if you're continuing a series uh, that, you know, your, your skills have increased significantly since the start because you're going to have to funnel people back to that first book and you want it to look its absolute best. So that's, that's a time to polish something up. Uh, and Andrea can attest to this better than I can, but when you're really seriously thinking about going back and reworking something, that is a candidate for re-release as opposed to simply tuning it up. I can attest to that. <laughs> um, so yes, definitely. Re-releasing something can be a fantastic project, especially if you're in a position where writing new books isn't possible. So for example, when my kids are sick, revising is often easier than writing. And so I did take advantage of that when I rewrote and revised my Clinic Chronicles. Um, you do need to weigh whether it would be a good use of your time though, because poorly written poetry as an example doesn't sell well, but neither does poorly um, well-written poetry. So you're going to want to look at the genre and see if it's working well for other authors and then figure out if you've got, if what you've got can also work well if you did a rewrite. Um, and the amount of work, uh, if the amount of work is too much, don't do it. So for example, if your story is like 10,000 words, it should be 40,000 words to sell well, unless there's a huge possible profit, I'd say write something new instead. Um, as another example, if you have a novel that you've marketed, and this is something that I did, if you have a novel that you've marketed as a romance that is really an epic fantasy adventure, but it's only half the length it needs to be, and you don't write epic fantasy normally, um, and like I said, this is something I've done, then reworking it would be kind of pointless. So I don't, I have that series, a little, a little story I wrote, it's about 30, 40,000 words long. It's a complete story, and it's just never going to sell well. And so there's no reason for me to to rework it and republish it. So you kind of have to base, have to weigh the time versus possible profit that you'll make off of it. Cause frequently you are really are just better off writing the next book. I have not pulled anything and reworked it, but I also workshopped a couple of other novels before I wrote and published what eventually became the first book in my Emperor's Edge series. And I had, you know, sold quite a few short stories and that kind of thing. So I wasn't, this wasn't like my first book ever. I, I do think if you have a lead into a series, especially that isn't pulling its weight, that that's when you want to consider reworking it. Uh, as people are not going to give book two a chance if book one didn't grab them. And it's, Unfortunate because with your first series, your book one probably is the weakest. Uh, often, even with later series, I still struggle with like having a really rocking book one. That's why I love the box sets because it gives me a little bit more time to, <laughs> to really suck them into the series. Um, but yeah, I, I, and as far as just older stuff that maybe not up to par, you, you know, I would probably pull it if it, you know, I haven't done that, but. If, if you think you're much better as an author now, you don't want that to be somebody's first experience with you because, you know, a lot of readers are just not going to give an author a second chance. There's so much stuff out there, as we've been talking about now, that they're probably just going to move on to someone else. Okay, next up is from Rob Peacher. Uh, my backlist has historically performed well. In September and October, it dropped off quite a bit. None of my books performed the way they had previously. Even newer titles weren't selling like I would have expected. What's tactics, what's tactics that work well to keep your backlist lively? Um, and I, I'm going to say that a new book is usually the best way to buoy sales uh, of earlier books in a series. So if your book is in a series and you want to drive more people back, a new book will help. Uh, David Gogren has talked a lot about doing a full series promotion where you will do steeper time-limited time, uh, yeah, time discounts on earlier books, but, but gradually increasing prices across the rest so that your entire catalog, back catalog, well, your entire series, for example, is discounted to some degree with the, the greatest discounts at the beginning. Uh, he also talks about doing carousel ads on Facebook so that you can direct to the individual books and people will see your full series as a part of a single ad. Or 
doing just a regular ad, but directing it to the series page on Amazon or, or having a reading list for, for, for a universal link. And that's another way that you can drive people to an earlier book in a series by using more recent books as the draw. Um, yeah, it's possible you've reached saturation point with your backlist, uh, depending on your genre and the amount of downloads you've already had. Uh, so what I would suggest doing is create a couple of Facebook ads and tweak things until you have one or two that work and then keep that them, them, it, whatever, as a low burn background ad that brings in a slow but steady supply of traffic to your book. So like $5 a day and then focus on writing new things. Uh, you can also run a single author giveaway also targeting through Facebook ads and keep an eye on new subscribers to your newsletter list. Uh, basically, so if you're constantly having a little bit of, of traffic flowing to that that book or those books on your backlist, then that kind of helps the rankings not drop on Amazon as much. And then you can be focusing on writing new stuff at that point. Um, but usually when my backlist stops selling, it's because I've neglected to keep that, that little bit of traffic going. Um, if you've reached saturation, you're going to need to break, take a break probably for a few months, write a whole bunch of new stuff and possibly consider switching out a cover or two and start advertising the backlist again. And the reason I recommend switching out a cover or two is sometimes people who would like your book are not attracted. Not everybody's going to be attracted to every book cover. And so people who would like your book will see that old cover over and over again. And they will not download. But if you put a new cover on it, sometimes it will push uh, people who normally would love the book over the edge to downloading. I would say that it is just difficult as more time passes, especially after you've finished up a series and you're not putting out new installments anymore. It's harder to keep the older books selling. Your options are basically pay for advertising, like Andrea was talking about, uh, running, running group promos. I'm about to jump into a box set. I think Joe is too for sci fi. Uh, I'm doing a series I published in 2016, putting the first book in box set with about seven other authors. We're going to have it out there wide, have it everywhere for free. So hopefully that's, that's the kind of thing that can get new people into an older series. It's already wrapped up and complete. Uh, you can also plug your older stuff in your, in the back of your newer books, especially if in the, they're in the same genre. You know, when I do this urban fantasy series, I'll be like, Hey, I also wrote this contemporary fantasy series back in 2013 that nobody bought that you should check out. <laughs> and uh, I hopefully will finish up that series while I'm doing all this. But uh, yeah, it's, it's always gonna be a challenge. Amazon does prefer newer releases. That's why I was saying to Joe, like, hey, maybe, you know, put some bundles together or something that will be seen as a newer release. I'm less certain on the other sites if that's as big of a deal, but it just seems like it's a lot easier to have, you get like a little boost from having a new release and advertising it versus just trying to start from scratch with a book that's 1 million in the store and to start advertising it. It's like, you're really pushing that boulder uphill. So think of some other, you know, I usually try to do promos for my book ones in my older series about once a year. If I can get a book bub, great, but I'll still do like, a, you know, just go and book like three e-reader news today, you know, free book, see if it's going to be free, uh, book barbarian, if I can get them and, you know, just try to give away a couple thousand copies of an older book one in a series. So that's it for me on that one. All right. Um, next up is from the same person. I'm about to start dabbling in audiobooks. Is there a good platform to adver advertise those? And I think Chirp uh, is, is uh, the book advertising platform. Uh, also, find a way just announced. You can do find a way has a promotional like they used to send out emails so that you could apply for to promote your book, and now they just they just made it so that you can just go to a page and and sign up there. There's no longer going to be a monthly sign up thing. So, those are two ways, I guess. Uh, for chirp, just to be clear on what that is, because I actually didn't know either until uh, Nink. It's not an advertising thing it's actually bookbub's platform that it's basically a store another storefront for audiobooks and find a way to get in you, they, you go through find a way and they distribute to chirp and then bookbub is starting to have you know i think it's like i said just uh invite only now but it should be pretty soon available to everyone where you can just apply for um these deals, if you are in the Chirp store and you're willing to lower your price, it's, it's the same as the eBooks. They want bargain books. I did one in December for, um, did we already talk about this? I feel like we already talked about this. I did one for my 99 cent eBook and, or audio book and it did pretty well. Um, there's, and then as far as other platforms go, other ways to advertise the audiobooks, we always ask this to people like, who are doing well and it seems to be like a little bit of a fluke or just there's some 
great marketing that they happened to do with an awesome cover and something caught up, uh, took off. A lot of times bundling, I, I see people doing really well. If you, if you have all the rights and you did your eBooks yourself and you can choose to uh, do books one, two, three in a big bundle, Audible still allows that. You may have to take down the individual titles, I believe is how it goes. Although I've heard also of people that didn't get caught <laughs> and have both up there. But um, that's not really an advertising method, but it's sort of, a way to make that credit look really good. So it's a bit of a, you're gonna look better in the store than other ones. And then just, if you can get the book bub or if you can do a promo on your ebook, that usually will also help sales with uh, audiobooks, at least on Amazon. Um, and I, I feel like when I've surfed around on iBooks or iTunes, I, 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 I Apple, <laughs> Apple I, I can't speak, that uh, they're not necessarily linked together on the same page. I don't know, have you guys seen that? Am I, is that my imagination? I, I have to admit, I only buy audiobooks from Audible. <laughs> they do seem separate. And for some reason, when I've done searches, it seems like the audiobooks come up before the eBooks. I, my Apple stuff's a mess, and I think it's because I started out through Smashwords, and then I started doing it directly, and they've never really it's like the one store i don't really have a contact for unfortunately <laughs> so and now i'm thinking of going over to draft a digital for the next series and just kind of moving towards them and seeing if they can get me because i know them so maybe they'll be able to like get things straightened out at apple i don't know but my stuff's a mess there and i've had readers pointed out um probably my fault i just need to dig in a little bit and see find a contact for that but um that is about it if you promote the ebooks hopefully you'll get some extra sales of the audiobooks and I think we're going to stop there for the day. It's been over an hour and I got to pick up my doggy and yep. time to go. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you, if your question didn't get answered, it will probably show up in a later episode. Uh, please visit six figure authors with the number six for the episode notes to leave a comment or to just ask a question for, for a future show. And if you want to join us on the Facebook, we have a new group there to search for six figure authors or check the show notes for the link. Bye, everyone. See ya. So long, everybody. <laughs>